Okay, I guess we have some standards. All right. Um, well, welcome uh, today. I'm going to be the moderator of the program. I'd like to begin by introducing uh, Dan Hears, who is our Associate Director of the Hospital for uh, the Welcome and Greeting on behalf of us here. Thank you, Alan. And uh, thank all of y'all for coming out this morning. This is the first of a, a series of uh, brown bag lunches that we want to try and uh, share with our employees and, and any of the, the patients, visitors, or the community that's here uh, during these, uh, these speaking engagements. I'd uh, like to uh, acknowledge uh, Alan Clark's suggestion to start this uh, speaker series. Uh, Alan suggested that uh, we might want to let some of our veterans talk about some of their experiences during their uh, military careers so that we as employees and, and the community can, can remember those experiences and, and know why we are here and uh, why we as uh, Americans should be proud of what our veterans have done for us and, and for our country. And uh, our first program uh, today has to do with our POWs, and, and both of our speakers are, are former POWs. And uh, uh, next Friday is our National POW Recognition Day, and uh, that's why we chose that topic for our first uh, of our programs. And uh, we hope that uh, uh, because this is the first, is, is why we have such a light turnout today, but. If all of y'all would go back and tell some of your fellow employees and, and uh, friends in the community that we're, we're doing this, uh, maybe we can get more people out to hear some of these stories in the future. Uh, we will have the next program in December and uh, look forward to all of y'all coming back and, and even more people coming back to hear these stories. But, but thank you for coming today. Uh, thank our speakers for, for taking the time to share some of their experiences with us. And again, thanks to Alan Park for suggesting this. Uh, we, we do think it's a very good program. Thank you, Dan. Uh, yes, any of you all that are in the back, we have uh, several seats on the front row here. I don't know if you want to stand the whole time. Uh, just come on and uh, have a seat up front, please. Uh, I'd like to begin for any of those of us who are able to stand. I would like for us to stand and I will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Be seated, please. Well, we're really honored today to have uh, two gentlemen with us that are both uh, longtime personal friends of mine and are both uh, members of the Military Order of the Purple Heart chapter, of which I'm a member, and that's where we originally uh, had our affiliation and our acquaintanceship that developed into a friendship. Uh, the way we're going to do this, I'm going to introduce uh, Lewis Reed first. Uh, he will speak, and then I'll introduce our second speaker, Ira Simpson, and at the termination of both of their presentations, we will have a question and answer period available for any of you all in the audience who would like to have uh, any questions answered that they didn't fill in fill in the blanks on that you'd just like to know a little bit more about. So I'm going to start with Lewis Reed. Lewis Reed uh, enlisted on June 23, 1939 in the Army. In uh, April of 1941, he was assigned to the 35th, uh, 31st Infantry Regiment and uh, was in uh, a garrison unit in what was called the Walled City of Manila. He was, um, when the war started, he moved into the Bataan Peninsula, and he'll of course talk about that but he ended up being a uh, prisoner of war of the Japanese for three and a half years. He was released from active duty in February 46 as a sergeant. He married um, just before he got released from active duty by these dates here, actually. Uh, he has two living children and three grandchildren. He retired uh, after 31 years with the American Optical Company. I am very proud to introduce one of our World War II vets in our community that we're very proud of, uh, Lewis Reed. Hello, can, can you hear me all right? We can hear you. I was, uh, my name's Lewis Reed. I was in the U.S. Army and has been mentioned in 31st Infantry Regiment. 
which uh, was a part of the so-called Philippine Infantry Division. The other two regiments in the division were uh, Philippine Scout Regiments, which had Filipino enlisted personnel and American officers. And they were also a part of the U.S. Army. Then there was also something over there called the Philippine Army, which was totally different from Philippine Scouts, not, not to be confused with them. And uh, they were mostly draftees that had been hastily gotten together in 1941 when Douglas MacArthur took over the command of the uh, what was called the U.S. Armed Forces in the Far East at that time. Well, after Pearl Harbor, uh, I felt like I was fired some of the first shots in World War II and American participation in it after Pearl Harbor. It was the day after Pearl Harbor, our barracks were right near Nichols Field, which is the Army Air Corps fighter base. And uh, the Japanese bombers and Zero fighters came over and bombed and strafed the area for about an hour and completely wiped out Nichols Field during that time. And I was laying on my back in a, in a ditch with my M1 rifle fire. I fired several clips uh, with my M1 at the Jap Zeros that were flying around low and strafing the area. Nobody knew that they were called Zeros at the time. And nobody knew what the heck they were, really. But they had big red meatballs on the side and made a good target. And uh, although they were a lot faster than anybody thought, I doubt if we hit anything. So that was my introduction to our participation in World War II. We went from there into the Bataan Peninsula. Manila was declared an open city and we had to get out of Manila. Went to Bataan, which was a peninsula between Manila Bay and the China Sea. We uh, set up the main line of resistance over there. And uh, by January, uh, by the end of January, we had one big major battle with the Japanese that were attacking and had landed at Lingan Gulf. And uh, the 14th Japanese Army, uh, we had the high ground and they had to, they had to advance across rice paddies below us. And we all but wiped out the Japanese 14th Army in that particular battle. And they withdrew and things were relatively quiet in the combat area for a couple of months until they got reinforcements. We were promised reinforcements over shortwave radio from San Francisco all the time. Constantly they were saying, hold out. Uh, thousands of troops, tanks, and airplanes are on the way to relieve you. And of course, this was all a lot of baloney as we found out later. But uh, anyway, we finally uh, ran out of food. Everybody had malaria just about, dysentery and a few other things. And on April the 9th, 1942, General King surrendered the entire command of Bataan. Now this left Corregidor still in action out on an island in Manila Bay. Bataan and Corregidor were really two separate things. And uh, then began the Bataan Death March, so-called. I don't know whether you've heard of the Bataan Death March or not, but it's fairly well known in the literature. I made every inch of that, and it wasn't, all, it wasn't all that long, but it was not the problem. The length of it was not the problem. It was about 70 miles long, but the problem was that a lot of people were sick with malaria, dysentery, and various other things, and uh, Japanese didn't put up with that kind of stuff, and if they fell out, they'd ban at them. And uh, occasionally tanks would run over them if they were lying in the road, one thing or another. All in all, in the Bataan Death March, Approximately, there were approximately 1,900 deaths, of which 700 were Americans. There were about 10,000 American troops on Bataan. There were many thousands of Filipino troops. But uh, of those that died on the death march, about 700 were Americans, and, and the rest of 1,900 were Filipinos. We got in the first camp at Camp O'Donnell. In the first six weeks or so there, 1,300 Americans died. Food was practically non-existent, medicine was non-existent. And so then this thing went from bad to worse all through 1942. Uh, later on, I worked, did pick and shovel work for a year in 1943 and 44. And when the Americans came back in and attacked in 1944, about two weeks ahead of late landing, I was put on a prison ship for shipments to Japan. 
We, uh, we were going about 600 miles to Formosa first. It took us 38 days to make that 600 miles. All the ships in the convoy were sunk, except the one I was on. A torpedo came at our ship, dived under it, and came up on the other side. His American subs were all over the China Sea, and they were sinking Japanese freighters right and left. These ships were unmarked, and many of them had prisoners. There was another ship that left two weeks after mine, called the Arasan Maru, that had 1,800 American prisoners on it. And it was sunk by our own subs, and there were nine survivors. Altogether, about 5,000 Americans died by being sunk in the China Sea during this period of time. Eventually, after spending a couple of months in Formosa, I got another ship and wound up in Japan. Uh, I was in the mountains in northern Japan most of the time, working for a, a familiar Japanese company with slave labor in an underground mine. And uh, I spent about three months of 1945 in Tokyo in an experimental medical camp. And uh, that was an interesting experience in itself. And I, I could go on at great length about these things, but I don't have much time. But uh, I'd like to uh, point out that when the war was over, we were in the mountains in northern Japan. We were never liberated. We finally just left. The Japanese all beat it. The guards, and everybody went and hid out. Nobody knew where they were, so we just left and uh, eventually got down to uh, the port of Sendai and, and the Navy was in there and the 101st Airborne, was, or 11th Airborne was in there and uh, they took charge of us and got on LST, got on a, a Navy hospital ship called the USS Rescue and I came all the way back to the United States on the USS Rescue, Navy hospital ship. Spent a couple of weeks at Letterman General Hospital, rode a hospital train from San Francisco to Fort Worth Took a week, finally got back home. And uh, my coming was unannounced. I had to call, call up a relative on the phone to come down and pick me up. And uh, that just about winds it up in, in short. I don't have a lot of time, but we want to entertain some questions. Thank you very much, Lewis. You know, the military is a real small world because that town Sendai you made it to the coast on uh, I was there four years later as an army brat when my dad was stationed in Sendai Japan um, our second speaker uh, had his experiences as a POW in the other theater the European theater uh, in Europe and so we wanted to give you all an idea of the two different uh, spectrums of the POW experience during World War II um, Ira Simpson is a retired uh, major from the United States Air Force and is also president of the Greater Dallas Veterans Council. He enlisted as an aviation cadet in March of 1942. He was a navigator and did some training, uh, maybe all of his training at Hondo, Texas Army Air Base. Uh, he was a second lieutenant assigned uh, to the 389th Bomber Group at uh, Hethel Army Air Force Base in, in England. He was a navigator on a B-24 and he was shot down uh, on his 20th mission over Germany, but he actually, uh, the plane apparently made it back to Holland. I'm sure he'll tell you a little bit more about that. He was uh, captured on February 14th, 45, repatriated April 29th, 45. Uh, he returned to the United States June. 20-year retiree, as I mentioned. Uh, he was in the oil and gas business, had a second retirement from Southern Union Gas after uh, a number of years there. He was married in June 45, seemed to have had a lot of uh, June through uh, January 46 marriages from World War II, of course. Uh, he has three children and six grandchildren. I'd like to introduce to you Iris Simpson. Thank you very much, Alan. Can you hear me all right? Alan gave you basically my background. After I graduated from navigation school in Hondo, I was assigned to a B-24 crew. We were trained in Charleston, South Carolina, and in August of 1944, flew our aircraft across the North Atlantic to England and joined the 389th Bomb Group. We began our combat mission right away. And on our first mission, we got a quite an introduction to the German anti-aircraft in that 
As we came back off the target, the, our co-pilot was wounded and he was so severely enough that uh, he then had to be returned to the States. I flew 20 missions. Uh, about four of those missions, we were severely damaged by any aircraft fire. We lost engines. In one case, we lost two engines. We had to go down to low altitude to avoid fighting, but we did make it back to our base. On a mission just before we were shot down, we had to crash land in France at a German fighter base that had been just recently uh, taken over by the Americans. We had to, because the plane would not fly anymore, we had to leave it there and go back to England. On my 20th mission to Magdeburg, Germany, we received damage uh, from anti-aircraft fire over the target. We lost one engine that caught fire. We were able to extinguish that fire, but we were unable to maintain our altitude, so we began dropping back uh, behind the bomber groups. We lost a second engine shortly after that because we, they were continually firing at us, and we would fly along about, oh, maybe 100 miles or so, and the aircraft would stall out. We started out at 22,000 feet. When we got to Holland, we were down to 2,000 feet and we're out of gasoline, so we had to bail out. As I was coming down in my parachute, I was drifting into some high power lines, so I dumped my parachute and fell about 40 feet, knocking myself unconscious. And when I came to, uh, there was a German soldier there with a rifle in my face. And they got me up and put me on a wagon, and they had the body of my tail gunner there. He was the one, only one that got killed. His parachute did not open. Uh, as we were coming down, of course, they were firing at us. Uh, fortunately, no one was severely injured uh, from that fire. And they, after we were captured, we were taken to a, an aircraft site where we were kept overnight. And then I was reunited with my crew the next day in, in the city hall of this little city where we landed. After that, I was taken back into Germany. On the way back uh, from Holland to uh, the interrogation center, we had to go through the uh, town of Dusseldorf, which had just been bombed by the British. I, everything was burning. Uh, it, it, it's hard to imagine that you see what was actually taking place. The bombs were still going off. soldiers, uh, we got to the railroad station where we were supposed to take a train. The civilians attacked us and we were saved by the guards by putting us on a train and getting us out of town on the train. Uh, we were forced in that respect. I went to the interrogation center and I put in solitary confinement for three days and they interrogated me. And of course you're instructed to give name, rank, and serial number only. And after about a period of two hours uh, interrogation, the German major that was interrogating me said, well, you won't tell me anything, I'm going to tell you some things. So then he showed me a book where he had my crew listed and every man where we were from, where we graduated from, uh, our schools in the Air Force and uh, who our parents were, every man on the crew. So that goes to show that their intelligence was super. From there, I went to prison camp at Nuremberg, Germany. At the prison camp, uh, we were 
you know, I was put in a room with 16 other men about the size of an ordinary bedroom. We had to cook our own food, if we had any, which we didn't. Uh, we had, uh, for breakfast, we had hot water. You could shave with it or make soup if you had something to make soup from. For lunch, you got a little square of bread about that big, uh, made out of sawdust. For the evening meal, you got potato soup made from rotten potato peels, uh, a bowl of that. We did occasionally get a Red Cross parcel, which had milk and other things like that, and cigarettes. Now, we used the cigarettes to trade with the guards to get additional food, if we could, or other things that we might need. As the Army got closer to our camp, we were moved from there and marched about 100 miles to another prison camp in Mooseburg, Germany. Now, during this march, we were not fed anything except what we could get from the local farmers as we went through the countryside. Uh, it was many potato fields, and we'd go out into these fields and get potatoes uh, that were not rotten and, and cook those. Uh, we traded cigarettes with the German farmers uh, for other food. And in fact, one morning I got up uh, and left sleeping in a farmer farm. I took two cigarettes and the lady cooked me two eggs. So that was pretty good. We were liberated by General Patton's Third Army on April the 29th, 1945, after a major tank battle right outside the camp. And several of our men were injured because the bullets were flying through our camp and people were running out to see what was going on and I was guilty of the rest of doing that. Uh, the main thing in our camp, of course, was we, the lack of food. No one had any food. Uh, we all lost a lot of weight. We uh, made ourselves sick when we got liberated because the 99th Infantry provided us some food and we overate. But uh, one of the things that I remember, of course, is General Patton coming into camp and saying, here you guys are just laying around while I'm out flying and fighting the war. And then he left. Uh, I was returned to the States in June of 1945 and came home. Uh, I did notify my family that I was on the way. They met me and then I came in on the 16th day of June. I got married on the 28th day of June. I keep telling my wife that she caught me in a weak moment when I got back to the <laughs> town. <laughs> and I, the best thing I do is walking down the aisle. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to have a Q&A, uh, and I, but I know that people will have to start leaving um, for various reasons and so forth. Please stay as long as you want to stay, and I know they can stay and answer as many questions. It depends on when you came in, etc. But before uh, I begin the Q&A, I would like to take this opportunity before anybody leaves the room to uh, acknowledge how proud we are of them. And if there are any other World War II vets in the audience, I would like you to stand and I would like the audience to acknowledge them, please. delighted and honored to have you on the panel today, of course, and the rest of you to visit with us. We thank you very much. I'm from Pennsylvania. And after I received my commission, I was assigned to the Texas Division, 36. All right. So a lot of combat, North Africa, Italy, and France, on into Germany. You've got some good... I made it back. We're very, we're very proud of the 36th Infantry Division in Texas, obviously, sir. Um, we're delighted and honored to have you all with us, and uh, this place is not just a place of healing in body, soul, and spirit, but is a, a special place in our community and in North Texas where we honor veterans. Uh, would you like to start with uh, any Q&A from the audience, questions from the audience, and answers them? Yes, Jeremy. Lewis, I, I heard about said they, what did y'all think of the time, and I know that the here, uh, I'm going to repeat. 
repeat that, okay, in case anybody didn't hear it. Uh, the question was, we heard what the uh, culinary delights were in Europe, and we're asking, uh, Charlie has asked Lewis what kind of, uh, what the food the kitchen prepared in his POW camp in uh, the Philippines. Well, we had a real gourmet diet. Uh, does anybody in here know what Lugao is? Anybody ever hear of Lugao? That's kind of a byword among I mean, POWs from Japan. It's, it's a way of boiling rice with a lot of water, so it stretches it about 10 times. You wind up with a, with a kind of a rice gruel that's about 10 times the volume the ordinary rice would be after it's cooked. That's called lugao. That's a Filipino term. And uh, another thing, we had, we had a lot of soup. We had a lot of rice and a lot of soup. Not enough of it at one time, but we, that's what we had during the whole course of events. We had a soup that we called fish eyeball soup. Yeah. If you don't know what fish eyeball soup is, well, they throw about a, a whole basket full of minnows in with the soup, little minnows. The minnows disintegrated in the boiling process, and the eyeballs were left floating on the surface. And they were hard, kind of hard to eat. But that's fish eyeball soup. Another thing we have is called whistle weed or blowgun greens. And this was the kind of greens they put in the soup. It had woody hollow stems that were inedible. That's why it was called bluegum soup or whistleweed soup. That's some examples that answer your question. Lewis, do you fish today? Yeah. Do you still fish? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions, please? Do you eat sardines? Do you eat sardines? Yeah. <laughs> I, eat, I eat anything. An XPOW eats about anything and will eat fast before the flies get it. Any questions from the audience? Yes. The, the question is, uh, with a lot of, um, obviously, death and a lot of people that were really hurt severely in, in their camps, uh, what kept them going? What was it that you relate that explains what kept you going? Let's start with Ira, and then we'll, we'll come to you again, Lewis. Well, I think primarily what kept me, what kept me going was the fact that uh, I had faith in, in my country getting me out, number one. Number two was that, uh, of course, there are no atheists in foxholes, and that was true in prison camp. We had, uh, we relied on our faith in God and our fellow man. And it did pretty well. And we looked out for one another. We, we took care of each other. And that kept us going. Really. Well, I agree with what Ira said. Plus, uh, I did observe that a lot of people, I say a lot, quite a few that I knew, died of starvation because they just simply could not adjust to adverse circumstances. People that had grown up without ever having a tough in their life, you know, they could sit there with a mess kit full of maggoty rice in front of them and they couldn't eat it, couldn't choke it down. They died of starvation. I could eat anything. It didn't, uh, it didn't eat me first, I ate it. How about that, the way with us? If, if we had bugs in our soup, we, that, we felt that was nutritious. That's one time in my military experience, too, that I never heard the men talk about women. All they talked about was food. We made a list of all the foods we were going to eat when we got back home. Uh, desserts, all of that. So I've, got, I've got a little book that i got all that in it. So. You know, we did the same thing. I, I compiled a recipe book. We exchanged recipes. <laughs> I've got some really weird recipes in it, believe me. Next question. I'd like to ask uh, both of them to respond to a question related to how would you define uh, the, the attitude and the treatment and the different uh, experiences of your captors? Well, of course, the Japanese, and I'll let Lewis indicate that, they were much more severe than the Germans. Uh, they actually, we, our guards uh, were mean. They would beat you. They threatened to suit you every day, but they didn't go around executing people just to be doing that. And they did, and I, I must give credit to the German 
medical people, they did try to treat the ones that were wounded. Well, we, uh, the Japanese, I think, is pretty well known. They, uh, for one thing, they never would admit that we were prisoners of war. They, they thought we were no better than dirt because we surrendered. And uh, that being their opinion, we were required to bow and scrape to the lowest rank in Japanese buck private among the guards. If you didn't, you got beat over the head with a rifle butt. And uh, that's just one of the things. Now, toward the end of the war, I was working in the mine in August of 1945, and uh, the Japanese already told us that if the Americans invaded the home of Japan, they were going to execute all the prisoners. This is a matter of record. In fact, I've got documentation for that. They issued an order. They brought in machine gun troops and set them up toward the end of the war. Well, on August 14th, I think it was the 15th over there, the war was over. They had already set a date of August 29th. They were going to execute all the prisoners. Now, there weren't that many Americans there. I mean, they, they couldn't have had over 25,000 American prisoners all told, but they had like 200,000 British, Australian, and Canadian prisoners. And they were going to execute the whole shebang on August 29th. They set a date for it. All during my three and a half year career as a prisoner of war, we were subject to execution at any time for no reason at all. That kind of keeps you on edge a lot of times. And uh, that, that's one way that and people would disappear for no reason. They'd, they'd do some infraction and the guards would pick them up and nobody ever hear from them again, ever see them again. Um, Lewis, did the, did the men captured at Corregidor come to your camp or to some other camp? Men captured at Corregidor were not on the Bataan Death March. The Bataan Death March was over by the time Corregidor surrendered. They did not come to the first prison camp, which was Camp O'Donnell, at the end of the Bataan Death March. They, uh, they came first, they, the Jeff marched them through the streets of Manila to humiliate them and to Bilibid Prison in Manila. And then they went by truck up to Cabana de Juan, which is the main prison camp in the Philippines. And that's where we first came in contact with them when I got there. Um, Ira, did you all, uh, did you all have, as something that you were always constantly working on, kind of trying to escape in those uh, in those camps in Europe. <laughs> well, each camp, of course, had uh, an escape committee, and they worked different means of trying to escape. We uh, did not dig any tunnels in this one that I was in. However, they did uh, cut the wire, and uh, we would have a distraction for the guards, and at night. Uh, then cut the wire and go out. We did have wire cutters and things of this nature. Each camp had an escape committee, and on that committee were the men that made the different uh, passes and documents that you needed. Uh, they had maps which were furnished uh, by the Army. Uh, sent to the prison camp in, in packages and that were disguised and there were certain people that were identified as what they called confidence men. They would get these this information from the states, uh, make the maps that were necessary for you to have, and also uh, these were turned over then to the men and they were dressed in civilian clothes or modified military clothes to civilian clothes and try to get out most of them didn't make it. Most of them were captured, but mainly because many, most of them did not speak German and somebody would say something to them and they couldn't reply. And they'd get briefly reported to the SS troop. In the Japanese, uh, we got some more questions here from the audience, okay? Over here in the back. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the question is, did you, each of you can answer, do you have any kind of recreational activities at all in the camps? Uh, in the camp I was in, about the only recreational activity we were able to engage in was just walking around the perimeter of the compound we were in. 
Uh, we didn't have any force equipment or anything like that. We did were able to get a few books uh, that we could read, but uh, we did not have any any type of activity outside of um, walking and this type. Of thing. Okay, Gus. Well, not not much. At times we had some. You're talking about a three and a half year period, and there was sometimes something, and sometimes not. I'd like to say a word that escape. Sure. Oh, yeah. Japanese, by the way, had a very interesting system for preventing escapes. Uh, they, they had in Command One, which we had about seven to eight thousand prisoners, American prisoners, in that camp. Uh, the Japanese took the alphabetical roster of the entire camp and divided them up in groups of ten, alphabetically. And these were called shooting squads. If one member of the shooting squad escaped, they rounded up the other nine and shot them. And this, this made people think twice before trying to escape, believe me, because nobody knew who was on the, on the shooting squad with them. So they couldn't all get together and go at one time or anything like that. And that worked pretty well. There were a few escapes, the shooting squad was rounded up and shot as a result of it early on in the war. And later in the war, they quit that, but that was very effective while it was in force. Thank you. Okay, we had another question back there. Gentleman, the blue shirt. They had a 100% turnaround in attitude. Believe me, I've never seen anything like it in my life. The day after the, it was announced to the Japanese that they had actually surrendered, and this was before the thing on the battleship Missouri. The day after that, I was being shaved with a straight razor by a Jap barber. <laughs> they were very, very friendly after that happened. Very, very. Uh, the same thing applied to the Germans. Now let me say this, the German civilian population that was around the camp that I was in were fairly sympathetic to, to our situation. It was the military that caused the problem, but once uh, they lost the battle and uh, we didn't see too many of the military, they were taken to a prison camp. Uh, but they, uh, they walked a complete turnaround from what it had been. They, they were <clears throat> trying to ingratiate themselves in, into, uh, with us so that we would not accuse them of any crimes against the, the, the prisoners. Vance, yes. The, the question is, have either one of you gone back to visit the, the sites of the camps where you were uh, uh, captive during the war? Uh, I have. I made three trips back to the old prison camp where I it's, uh, was converted into a area of warehouses and uh, apartments for Turkish people that had migrated to Germany. And it... All the buildings were refurbished, but it, it uh, but just became a part of the community. You cannot tell now where it existed. It became just a part of the little town. Yes, I went back once in 1987, 12 years ago, and uh, more or less first class, and uh, and rather thoroughly enjoyed it. I spent a couple of weeks over there and went to uh, the only place that bothered me was when I went back down into Bataan. I kind of felt a little queasy about going back down there. And uh, down the end of the tip of Bataan, down uh, near Marvelous, guess what I discovered? Texas Instruments Factory. Texans go everywhere down there, Lewis. <laughs> Texans go everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Yes. Um, how has, uh, emotionally, how have your experiences affected you since being back here? Do you guys have... Let me repeat the question. The, the question here is, uh, how have your experiences from the war affected you emotionally 
now that you're back. Is that accurately stated? Uh, it's kind of hard to say offhand. I mean, I, I certainly uh, enjoy the effects of it still. I mean, I, I've got a lot of physical problems. When they, several years ago, when the Congress passed a law relating to XPOWs, medical stuff, they had a POW protocol exam at the time. And when I took the POW protocol exam, I was found to, to be service-connected on 10 different things. Can you believe that? And this is years ago. But I was rated less than 10% on each one. So I got nothing as a result of it. But, that, but I was rated service-connected on 10 different things. And I still have the effects of a lot of these things. Let, let Ira answer. Second, and come right back. Now, of course, uh, I'm like Lewis, and, uh, with quite a few physical problems that I now have just now starting to show up as a result of that. Uh, I did have some problems immediately after I came back uh, with uh, our, I couldn't drink milk, uh, this type of thing, uh, lactose tolerance, I guess they call it. Uh, I had ulcers, which uh, had to be treated. Now it, it's my knees and things of that nature where I, when I landed in the parachute, I, I injured my knees, my back. That's beginning to show up. Uh, emotionally, uh, you still have some problems uh, when you think back on some of the things that happened. And, and, Losing uh, your friends, uh, having them uh, killed uh, as a result of the war, this type of thing. Did you have a follow-on question? Okay. All right, Vance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think that you have to take the The question is, uh, your rating, did those things get corrected through the years, Lewis, to upgrade your ratings? Yeah, pretty well. Okay. Yeah, Vance has pointed out that the VA is going through a review relative to the adjudication process and perhaps attempting to move uh, to a very fair level of percentage for service-connected disability for the POW. So we would like uh, people to know that the POW should come back in for maybe another exam or get an upgrade if they've had a problem getting their ratings uh, adjudicated and being at an appropriate level through the years. Uh, let's, we'll have time for about one more question. That's about it. Okay, uh, gentlemen, I would like to uh, close with our uh, uh, expression of appreciation and acknowledgement for you to take your time here for this to be a part of our archives in the library of the hospital. That's what the taping is all about uh, in commemoration of uh, POW Day, uh, especially in commemoration of the service that you've given to our country. And at the Military Academy at uh, West Point, where I was trained as an officer, we have a, uh, a song there that talks about we sons of a uh, we sons of today we salute you you sons of an earlier year and we sons and daughters here at the VA community we we salute you uh, sons of an earlier year we thank you very much for being here.
I'll see you around, okay? Well, what are you doing now? Are you retired or what?